And sure enough, the first week of May is perhaps the most horrible of the uprising to that point, because the first week of May sees major fighting around Homs, major armed struggle between armed security, prote armed protesters and the security forces. And there are reports that protesters are being shot by snipers, that protesters are being targeted as they march through the streets, and there are reports that at least some of the protesters are shooting back. Some of the protesters have armed themselves to protect their neighborhoods. The skirmishes then spread into the neighboring province of Idlib. And Idlib province becomes the center of armed rebellion as the month of May goes by. The end of May sees the rise of a movement across the country to honor a 13-year-old boy who had been tortured and killed while he was in custody of the security forces. And this popular protest movement that honors the memory of Hamza Ali al-Khatib drew marchers into the streets, drew marchers into the streets to express sympathy for the family of the boy and to say, we are all Hamza Ali al-Khatib in protesting against the regime. At the beginning of June, the population of Homs goes back into the streets and regains control of Clock Tower Square on the occasion of what the organizers call Children of Freedom Day. So in memory of this 13-year-old boy, the population of Homs goes back into the streets. And the reports are that there are 50,000 people that take part in this mass demonstration in Homs. At about the same time, in the neighboring town of Jisr al shagur which is in the, uh, actually it's a little farther north, which is in the uh, countryside around Idlib, in the area of Jisr al shagur 120 security personnel were ambushed and killed. So once again, armed protesters, armed opposition to the regime, attacked the security service, carried out this military operation against the regime. And when the 120 security personnel were killed in the countryside outside Jisr al shagur the armed forces launched a major assault against that city. Tanks, troops, artillery mobilized against Jisr al shagur and as you may remember from the newspaper, the population of, Ibn, of Jisr al-Shagur basically abandons the city and flees across the border into southern Turkey. And there are reports of large-scale refugee camps, large-scale conglomerations of refugees fleeing the fighting. Army units, after they empty Jisr al-Shagur, sweep through a number of other cities in Idlib province, cities like Ma'arad al nutman and, and Khan Sheikhoun. I mention these towns by name because we have in our audience a, a world famous expert of the 1920 and 1925 rebellions against the French, and it's exactly this part of the country that was most active against the French in 1920. So we see a pattern perhaps, a resurgence perhaps, of rebellion on the part of people in that part of the country. By the middle of June, protests had even broken out in Deir Ezzor, in the far eastern part of the country. And once again, Syrian troops roll into Deir Ezzor, Syrian tanks retake the streets of this far eastern city. On the 20th of June, President al-Assad, who had pretty much been hiding after his previous speech to the nation. On the 20th of June, President al-Assad once again takes to the television. And on the 20th of June, President al-Assad once again claims that it's conspiracies that are responsible for the unrest. And this time he adds that it's also vandals who are taking advantage of the situation and vandalizing the country. And again makes reference to the germs who have come into the country from the outside. But during the course of this otherwise quite belligerent speech, the president proposes that there should be a national dialogue to hash out the country's problems, and that some sort of dialogue between opposition and regime is the way to end the unrest facing the country. 
the president's proposal to launch a national dialogue is immediately rejected by the opposition. Critics organizations immediately claim that this is not a serious proposal, claim that this is only window dressing. And instead, representatives of various opposition organizations meet in southern Turkey in Antalya, which is right about there, on the map, and hold the first general convention of opposition organizations against the Syrian regime. At the end of July, there are reports that some army units operating out here in Deir ez-Zor have defected from the regime. And we get the very first reports that there might be army officers and army soldiers who refuse to fire on the protesters. And there might be some army officers that are organizing against the regime itself. The reports are that these defecting officers have formed a free Syrian army. And there are reports that elements of the free Syrian army have linked up with the protesters and elements of the free Syrian army are fighting against the regular army out around Deir ez-Zor. And it looks like the opposition really has some firepower now. The opposition has some trained, well-equipped soldiers on its side. At the end of August, a prominent religious figure in Aleppo suddenly dies, and he suddenly dies while he's being watched by the police. So he dies under quite suspicious circumstances. Dr. Ibrahim Salkhini, who had been a senior religious figure in Aleppo, was reported to have given a defiant sermon during one of the Friday prayer services. And after he gave this defiant sermon, he had been visited by the country's security agents. And in the wake of a visit from Syria's security agents, uh, he not unreasonably had a heart attack. He was then taken to the hospital, put under police watch, and died in the hospital. So even though Aleppo had been very, very quiet, and even though there was no sign of popular unrest in this crucial city in the northern part of the country, when Sheikh Salhini dies and his funeral service takes place, several hundred young people in the northern city of Aleppo accompany his casket to the cemetery, and they shout the slogan, death but not indignity. And death but not indignity was one of the slogans that opposition protesters all across the country had been chanting prior to that time. So it looked like maybe there was some small sign of opposition breaking out in Aleppo as well. In early September, there, there are authoritative reports that the president was bringing back in a number of senior military commanders who had been forcibly retired at the end of the 1990s. At the end of the 1990s, a number of senior generals in the security services were suddenly thrown out of office. They were suddenly, uh, it was suddenly announced that they had taken retirement. But now, some of these senior generals have been reported as getting their jobs back, being reported as being brought back to command some of the major security services. And the generals that have been brought back were all closely involved in suppressing the Islamist movement of the 1970s. So it looks like the regime is bringing back hardliners, bringing back military officers that had used force to suppress the Muslim brothers at the end of the 1970s. On the 12th of September then, the very first of these national dialogues got underway. And I, I find it hard to find information about these things, but there's a number of national dialogue meetings that has taken place across the country. A number of different cities has had local level national dialogues. There was a national dialogue in Idlib. There's been a national dialogue in Dira, a national dialogue in Latakia, and so on. And these national dialogues have been occasions when local people have come in and expressed their grievances. 
And some of the reports say that these popular expressions of grievances have been pretty freewheeling, that people have leveled severe criticisms against the government. That's been a reasonably open session in these national dialogues. At the same time, however, as you may have seen in the paper, at the same time these national dialogues are taking place, the citizens of Homs marched into the public squares and burned Russian flags. Why do you suppose the citizens of Homs burned Russian flags? They burned Russian flags because Russia had consistently blocked the UN Security Council from condemning the Syrian government. And it's clear that the Russian government is trying to give some more time to the regime, some more time for reforms. The protesters claim that Russia is simply propping up the old regime, so the Russian flags were burned. In the middle of September, a number of opposition groups gathered once again in Antalya and have set up a Syrian National Council. So we now have an opposition organization the Syrian National Council. The Syrian National Council looks like it's going to be made up of 140 members. The numbers are a little unclear. They keep changing from time to time. But it looks like the Syrian National Council will have 140 members. It's going to have a secretariat of perhaps 25 or 30 members. The National Secretariat seems to be made up of seven different factions. So it's a huge umbrella organization. It's an attempt to include as many opponents of the regime as possible. What's intriguing to me is that at the same time that the National Council was meeting, at the same time that the National Council was announcing its membership and so on, a local group, more shadowy organization inside Syria, calling itself the Union of Coordinating Committees of the Syrian Revolution, announced that the coordinating committees were going to form an armed group to carry out the campaign against the regime through armed struggle. And the local coordinating committees announced they were forming a Salahuddin al-Ayyubi army to fight against the government. This new armed organization, the Salahuddin Army, joins a couple of other armed battalions that are already active in the area around Idlib. So it looks like there are armed militias that are preparing to take up force, armed militias that are preparing to fight against the army using weapons. In mid-October, the army and security forces swept through the region around Idlib. There were mass arrests. There were confiscations of weapons. There was not the kind of battle that we might have expected around Idlib, but there was certainly a large-scale military operation to try to fight against these brigades. Syria's foreign minister told Russian television on the 20th of October that all of the disorders in the country were caused by, you guessed it, al-Qaeda. And so Walid al-Mu'alim finally tells the country that it's in fact outsiders, in fact al-Qaeda, that's responsible for all of the problems in the country. But a week after that, units of the Free Syrian Army finally made their presence known. Elements of the Free Syrian Army, the defectors from the country's armed forces, took responsibility from an, for an attack against an army truck that was on the road in this area between Hama and Salamiya. And this attack on an army convoy killed nine different soldiers. So we now have reports that the Free Syrian Army is operating, is skirmishing against the government, at least in the northwestern part of the country. 50 minutes later, and I've only spelled out the facts of the case. So much for the facts of the case. How can we begin to explain what's going on? The state of the art, I think, the best analysis that we have so far of what's going on in Syria, we can find in a pair of reports that was published in July of 2011 by the International Crisis Group. The International Crisis Group claims that a strong Sunni conservative outlook is responsible 
for the uprising around Ben Yass, and the crisis group claims that there are, quote, age-old grievances, cases of abuse by the security services, growing rebelliousness, and persistent communal fault lines that have fueled sectarianism in the country. So, smart as they are, the International Crisis Group points to some of these long-standing grievances, some of these old chestnuts about Syrian politics, some of the old chestnuts about splits inside the country. This kind of argument cannot really explain why the result, why the revolts have broken out at this particular time and in these particular parts of the country. The two reports do go on to list three factors that I think are more promising. The International Crisis Group claims that at least some of the protest in Syria is a result of what the report calls harmful effects of economic liberalization, especially harmful effects on manufacturing, that industries in the country have suffered dramatically from opening up the country to trade opening up the country to trade to Europe, but even more importantly, opening up the country to trade from Turkey, and more recently, opening the country to trade from the People's Republic of China. And goods from China, goods from Turkey have been flooding into the Syrian market, have been driving Syrian companies into bankruptcy, have been forcing local textile com companies and plastics companies to go out of business. So the level of disruption of the local economy, thanks to liberalization, the crisis group says we might find some of the sources of unrest in the country. Second, the international crisis group points out that Syria is suffering from a truly horrendous drought and that the long time severe <laughs> drought in the country has had, its words, a devastating impact on agriculture. And sure enough, the stories of how agricultural areas in the northeast part of the country have been devastated by the drought and how whole villages and whole towns have had to move out and move to Aleppo and move to Hama and Homs to try to find some food and some kind of employment are truly horrific stories. So no doubt, so no doubt part of what's taking place we might trace to problems in the agricultural part of the country. And last, the International Crisis Group points out in a kind of footnote that the disorders in Syria might be traced to what the crisis group calls the role of powerful smuggling networks, especially powerful smuggling networks along the border with Jordan. So perhaps there's more than just age-old grievances. Perhaps there's more than just sectarianism. Perhaps there are some elements of the country's current political economy that we will want to tie together with this important set of protests. But there's clearly more work to be done. My own thoughts about this run along the following lines, and I'll be brief, partly because, like everyone else, I, I really haven't figured out what's going on in Syria either. But my own thoughts would have us rec remember four or five useful things, four or five points of departure for those of you who want to write your dissertations about this particular case. First of all, I think we might want to trace some of this unrest and some of these protests to a couple of crucial communities, sectarian communities inside the country that had prior to this time been key constituents of the regime. So two parts of the country that had been pillars of the regime before now, but have now found themselves faced with deteriorating circumstances. One of these pillars of the regime is the Alawi community in the western, northwestern part of the country, the poorer Alawis out in the countryside. It's a cliche of Syrian politics that the Syrian regime is an Alawi regime, blah, blah, blah. We've read, we've read this a hundred times. But what we really know is that the Alawi members of the regime are largely clustered in Damascus. They have been getting richer and richer over time. They have been isolating themselves from the poorer parts of the Alawi community, 
and especially under the current president, Bashar al-Assad, many of the links between the Alawis out in the countryside and the Alawi elite in the capital have gradually been fraying. So it would not surprise me at all if much of the unrest in this part of the country could somehow be traced to the deteriorating relationship between rural Alawis and Alawis in the capital. The second pillar of the regime that seems to be crumbling and we need to pay attention to is the country's trade union movement. Um, it's certainly the case that the city of Homs has been a major area of public sector industry. The city of Homs has been a major center of public sector trade unions. And I guess I'm not too surprised that there's such a high level of protest inside Homs as public sector industry has been harmed so badly by imports coming into the country from outside. Public sector wages have not been able to keep up with inflation. Public sector unemployment has been skyrocketing. And in Syria, it's worth exploring whether or not the unrest and popular mobilization in Homs can be linked to these disaffected, uh, um, Im growingly impoverished trade unionists in the country. I've already said something about drought. Uh, let me say quickly that another thing we might pay attention to growing out of the literature in political science is that Syria seems to be approaching a kind of threshold above which large-scale internal conflict is more likely to occur. And there are scholars that have carried out important research, statistical research, about the kinds of countries that experience large-scale rebellion the level of development that countries reach when they experience internal conflict and civil war. And Paul Collier of St. Anthony's College, Oxford, has discovered on the basis of a large-scale statistical study that countries with authoritarian regimes begin to experience large-scale popular protest after the country goes over a per capita income of $2,750. Any country that has a per capita income less than $2,750 is unlikely to experience popular protest. The country's too poor. People are scrambling to make a living. There's no mobilization that takes place in truly impoverished countries. And it's only after a certain threshold gets reached that large-scale unrest begins to be possible. Syria, as of 2010, is right about that point. The World Bank figures for Syria show that Syria, right at the moment, has a per capita income of $2,410. That's pretty close. That's probably close enough for Syria to be jumping into the category of countries that might be ripe for large-scale popular unrest. I've spoken a lot, but I have to say one last word because I'm so pleased to be here at San Diego State University. During the 1960s and 1970s, scholars here at San Diego State University carried out a number of pioneering studies of internal conflict and resolution. And in ancient times, when I was an undergraduate, I would read the statistical <laughs> studies that were carried out by Ivo Feyerabend and Rosalind Feyerabend here at San Diego State University. And these large-scale quantitative studies of domestic political conflict focused on the period from 1948 to 1965. So the Feyerabends put together a whole data set about protests and popular unrest and regime change. They didn't call it that. That's a re current term. But regime change around the world in the two decades after the Second World War. And when we go back and read these studies today, there's a couple of things that jumps out at us. First of all, we discover, the Feyerabends discover, that Syria, even in the 1950s, stood at the high end of a scale of instability. So political instability, popular unrest, popular revolt is a long time trend. 
inside Syrian politics. In the 1950s, Syria stood at the high end of political instability along with Lebanon, which we often don't think of as unstable today, and Iraq. Oddly enough, in the 1950s and 60s, Tunisia represents an anomalous case. There's a real puzzle about Tunisia because the Feyerabends discovered that in Tunisia there were high levels of what the Feyerabends call social frustration, which is their primary independent variable, but yet Tunisia also had a low degree of political instability. So in fact, Tunisia is a really important case for us to study. Tunisia is an exception. Tunisia is, runs against the pattern across the region, even back in the 1950s. More important, the Feyerabends here at, U, here at uh, San Diego State discovered that political instability is most closely associated with moderate levels of political economic development. So the Feyerabends um, anticipated by four decades the work of Paul Collier at St. Anthony's, Oxford. The Feyerabends discovered that rich countries are highly stable and that very poor countries are also highly stable. But it's countries somewhere in the middle, countries that have a little bit of development that go across what Collier would, would call a threshold that are much more likely to erupt into large-scale domestic conflict. Last thing, the Feyerabends discovered that large-scale domestic conflict is much more likely to break out if regimes, in their words, fluctuate in using coercion against the opposition. That if regimes consistently use coercion, if regimes always crack down on the opposition, then opponents know what to expect and they largely stay home. But if regimes sometimes crack down and sometimes don't, so the regime doesn't quite know what to expect. The regime thinks maybe it can, I'm sorry, the opposition thinks maybe it can march and not get shot at. It's this uncertainty and fluctuation in the use of coercion that is most likely to be associated with high levels of domestic political conflict. These kinds of general arguments give us only a beginning to understanding the process in Syria. But I, yet, but I think they give us the kind of firm foundation that we would need to, as we go forward, studying this case.